Today we have among us one of the most inspiring physicists of our time, Professor Philip Moriarty. He is the professor of physics at the School of Physics and Astronomy, University of Nottingham. And we also very well know him through his YouTube channel, 60 Symbols, where he and other scientists virtually and practically describe physics and astronomical phenomena. Great to have you, sir. It would be great if you could tell everyone a bit about yourself. Thank you so much. I do not deserve that introduction, that very, very kind introduction. It's an um, absolute pleasure to, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, I'm... Um, I've been now at the University of Nottingham since 94. I started as a postdoc here in 94 and then did three years as a postdoc. And I've been a lecturer since 97. So that's 25 years, which is a long time. Um, before that, I did my PhD at Dublin City University. And I've always worked in my research has always worked um, or been involved with uh, surface science, nanoscience, Imaging single atoms, single molecules, trying to push them around or pick them up, put them down, prod them, poke them, measure them in, in a variety of ways. And we use scanning probe micro microscopes a lot. And I've been, it's been a great pleasure to work with a lot of very, very talented people over the years. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Yeah, I'm, I'm also very, very interested in science communication. Um, and public engagement. I should just one point of clarification. 60 Symbols is most definitely not my channel. It's um, it's a collaboration between uh, School of Physics and Astronomy and a number of my colleagues um, and myself contribute to it. But it's really the brainchild of somebody called Brady Harron, who you probably know is behind not just 60 symbols, but number file, computer file, uh, what else, periodic uh, videos, wide range of different channels. And it's a uh, a pleasure and a challenge to work with Brady. Thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so you said you've always worked with nanostructures and uh, stuff like that, right? So uh, I would like to ask that, how did you know that physics was the right subject for you? Uh, and a follow up uh, to that might be like, uh, why did you choose experimental uh, physics over theoretical? That's a, that's a great question. Well, first of all, I'll answer your second question first. I'm not a great mathematician. Um, I have always I enjoy maths, but I've always struggled um, with maths. It's not something that comes entirely naturally to me. Um, certain elements of maths that I really enjoy, like Fourier analysis, that's fairly natural at this stage, but it certainly didn't come natural at the start. I'm much more drawn to computing and much more drawn to discrete mathematics and algorithms than sort of pen and paper. Um, there's nothing I like more than coding a simulation. I'd much rather do that than, you know, solve some horrible triple integral. But then I guess most of us would rather do that than solve some horrible triple integral. Um, in terms of being drawn to experimental physics, uh, that I can trace back very easily. And I've, I've told this story before a number of times, um, including to Brady a number of times. Uh, so I got very interested in physics when I was about 10 years old. My uncle, uh, a guy called Benny, was uh, a radio amateur. So he was very interested in radio transmission, radio reception, etc. And he used to have aerials and antennas strung up all over the place, used old valve sets for radios, not even solid state, moved on to solid state. But he and I, when I was 10 years old, built a crystal radio. So a crystal radio is just four components, diode, a capacitor, an inductor, and headphones, basically. That's it. And we we didn't even have a circuit board as such. We had a piece of wood, and we used drawing pins, and we put the components together that way. And um, you put the headphones on. There's no power source. There's no battery. And you, you hear a radio station. I was like, first of all, well, that's wow that you can hear a radio station. But then you think, well, where's the energy coming from? What's powering the headphones? And what's powering the headphones is the radio waves around us. So and that just mucking around with wires, mucking around with circuits. I spent a lot of time doing that as a kid. So I was naturally drawn towards the more experimental side of physics. I see. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I did not know about that. So uh, let, let's get a little more into the, your physics side, right? Um, why nanostructures? Like, how did you, what, what, what was your journey to nanostructures? 
again, that, that starts from a fairly early age. I got, um, when I was about nine years old, nine or ten again, um, I got a microscope um, as a Christmas present from my parents and used to put stuff, you know, spit on stuff and <laughs> take bugs and put them on slides and look at those and try and zoom in. So I've always, I know a lot of people, a lot of kids are drawn to sort of the, you know, universal side of things, the galactic side of things. And I used to go out and look at stars and constellations as well. But I was always more drawn towards the teensy, tiny stuff rather than the very big stuff. So more the quantum side of things than the sort of general relativity side of things. Let's put it that way. And so I was always drawn along those lines. And then when I finished my degree, and I was not a great student, but when I finished my degree, an opportunity came up to work with a scanning uh, tunneling microscope to do a PhD in that area. And it was shortly after um, this PhD was announced shortly after um, Don Eigler and colleagues at IBM um, in the US had manipulated individual atoms to spell out the IBM logo. And then they went on to do even more wonderful things with quantum corrals and the like. And I found that very inspiring, the idea that you can manipulate matter right down at the atomic level and push atoms around on a surface. So um, that's really why I got drawn into towards, towards that side of things. Uh, that's great, but uh, see, for me, uh, it's like uh, the small, the nanostructures things are, it's like uh, a little complicated to my uh, head, head, right? So how does one get to like, okay, no, this is what I like. This is, this, this is it. Uh, how did you get that? Where, where did you uh, jump through that confidence level? Yeah, this is what I like. I guess... Yeah, it's an interesting one. I just, I guess the thing that's always guided me or the thing rightly or wrongly is, do I find this interesting? And even if it's complicated or maybe especially because it's complicated and I want to learn more, that that's how I get drawn down in that general direction. Um, in terms of, yeah, it's difficult to get, it's always difficult to get, get your head around quantum stuff, but that's what makes it very, very interesting. You know, if we know something, but you know, if we've, if we knew everything, then there'd be no scientists at all to be out of a job. So the fact that there are these open questions, particularly about quantum, I've always been drawn to quantum. In fact, I'm teaching a second year, one of our undergraduate modules called the quantum world. And I've wanted to do that for quite some time. And I really, really enjoy that um, because there are still these open questions. And, you know, our generation hasn't done such a great job in trying to work out these questions. Hopefully your generation will come along and tell us where we were getting it wrong all along. So, um yeah, it's it's always good to work on problems that, you know, are difficult problems. Um, that makes them intriguing and interesting. That's great. Thank you. for uh, Thank you so much. So just for the record, sir, only your generation inspires us sir, to do great things. <laughs> yeah. So, sir, how did you know that your passion lies in research and teaching? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I guess very early on in my PhD. So I did, I was, I'll be honest, um, as an undergraduate, I was not very good. I got very, I'm into music and I was in a band and I got very heavily distracted with, let's be honest, trying to be a rock star, which didn't work out, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. But I, particularly in the third year of my degree, I was spending a lot of time away from my studies. We were playing twice at the weekends maybe a couple of times at the weekends and I remember from my maths exam in third year we had a gig we had a um yeah a gig um as the band which was in a place called uh Donegal which is quite a far away from um where my home was and I remember getting back in at three o'clock in the morning after that and then getting on a bus to go to Dublin to do my maths exam which I didn't do particularly well in. So um, then in my fourth year, uh, my final year, my degree, I the thing that really piqued my interest and the thing that really got me engaged was the final year project, which was actually well away from nanoscience. It was on medical imaging, um, computerized tomography and CAT scans. And... Um, that really gave me a kick in the behind and I started to get engaged and worked really, really hard in fourth year. And then when it got into my PhD, I would say within the first year of my PhD, I was thinking I want to have an academic career. I enjoy this. I enjoy the research side of things. I'm obsessive enough and um, stubborn enough to, to really want to pursue this. And um, that's that's really, you know, that's really how I, I, how I got into the academic career. 
um, largely because it was there's a great deal of independence. Um, I had a wonderful PhD supervisor who gave me a, a great deal of independence and allowed me to sort of to pursue my own ideas. Obviously, directed those ideas because some of those ideas were stupid, but um, he really gave me a lot of freedom. And that there's an awful lot to be said for having the independence to do what you want to do without a boss saying you should do this. Um, so that's that's really um, er, very early on in my PhD. I knew I wanted to be an academic. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> that completely yeah. answers. Uh, so, so, so you just mentioned that uh, you wanted to be a rock star, right? So, uh, we, we, we have to talk about it now. So, how did you pick up music? Uh, where did it all start? Oh, right. So, I started playing guitar relatively late on. I would say I was about 14, I think, when I got my first guitar. And then spent a lot. There was no YouTube. There was no internet. This was in the days before YouTube. So I used to teach myself um, guitar by just listening. And there was no, this was pre-CD, so cassettes. And I put the cassette or the record, I'd lift the needle up on the record and put it down, play it, put it down, play it, put it down. And um, uh, te- ta- taught myself that way by year, um, various different guitar songs. I'm a big hard rock, big heavy metal fan. So started off with ACDC, then Iron Maiden, etc. learning all um that type of stuff and then uh, as a covers band that was the type of stuff we did it was a huge amount of fun and um i still still very interested in music i'm still trying to you know pick up a guitar as often as possible but it's not as often as i'd like but um yeah the, um there are many i love to bring a guitar into the lectures because there are many links of course between um vibrations on a string of course and quantum mechanics you know particle in a box that you do i'm sure you've already done if you haven't already done particle in a box you're going to do a particle in a box very soon um you know that what is that in terms of the 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 eigenstates there they're standing wave states so there's exactly the same um eigenstates as we have on a on a guitar string so there's lots and lots of links there that um are fun to draw out well we haven't done that but i'm looking forward to it now uh so so uh would you do you have any favorite bands <laughs> oh god yeah <laughs> How much time have you got? We could be here a very, very long time. My favourite band of, of all time is a band called Rush, a Canadian band, a Canadian trio, um, prog rock band. Um, I'm uh, also a fan of a Swedish band called Opeth, um, lots of other bands, band called Texan, band called King's X, um, but then also stuff like Kid Bush, Tori Amos, um, Beatles, of course, uh, early Genesis, Maiden, all the sort of metal classics, Maiden, Judas Priest, Metallica, Slayer, Anthrax, Megadeth, Meshuggah. I could keep going. <laughs> <Lots of bands. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we also listened to some of the bands you said, uh, but particularly right now, um, have you heard about this band called Gojira? It's a French band. Oh, oh the French band. band. Amazing. Yeah. So it's interesting. My daughter's... Um, Daughter's 18, she's just um, about to go to university soon, but um, I came into the house uh, a couple of nights ago and she was, play- coincidentally, she was playing Gojira, so yeah, it's a good band, and what's interesting about them is how they evolve. They were fairly, yeah. not standard, they've always had, a, they've always been a little bit different, but they were fairly, uh, I don't know, they weren't that unusual, but as they've evolved, they've, um, over the past few years, they're doing really, really interesting things that are outside the mainstream of metal, I would say. So, yeah, great band, really good band. So, coming back to physics a bit, so which phenomena or effect in physics do you find the most intriguing? Uh, I think I've already mentioned this, yeah, definitely uh, quantum mechanics. We don't understand, we still don't understand really what the wave function is. Um, Is it telling us about reality out there? Or is it telling us about our knowledge of reality? And those are two different things. Is there an out there? Is there a reality out there? And, you know, all the usual arguments about um, what quantum physics is telling us about the world. And the great thing, the thing, the reason I'm really drawn to it, and for me is a very visceral thing, and for anybody who's a scanning probe microscopist, like I am, so we we see those waves. So I'll be later on this evening, um, I'll be going into the lab or I'll be running the machine from, from home remotely. And we image those electron waves and you can set up, you can move atoms around and you can set up confining potentials for, for those waves. Um, you can do that particle in a box experiment. So it's a very, 
when you see those waves rippling on a surface and you move the atoms and you see how the patterns of waves change, it's a very, very visceral thing. And it's a, something that becomes very real to you. So I find quantum mechanics in general um, fascinating, but then so, so do many other physicists, all physicists probably. <laughs> Yeah. Nothing beats the experimental part of physics. No, no, I agree. Absolutely. No. And so I know some people get a great sense of achievement, um, you know, if there's some mathematical problem and they, they, get a, they get a solution, they get an analytical solution to that. That's OK. That's well and good. But really, it's when that connects to the real world, when you have an experiment that goes you know, either uh, confirms what you've seen um, in terms of the analytical maths or, you know, you have a simulation that produce, gives you a prediction and then your experiment um, confirms that prediction. That's science. That's that's the best. That really is the best. Yeah. 100% agree. 100%. So, so, so uh, let's talk about let's, let's talk a little, little, book, uh, little bit about your book now. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Which so, relates back to the theme of metal and 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 yeah, yeah quantum yeah. So, what was the motivation behind your book, and what did you uh, want to achieve uh, by writing it? So, the motivation was well, there are a number of different motivations. First of all, I'm always very very happy year in year out when I see new students coming in to the the lecture or coming into the the department. And they have Zeppelin T-shirts or Metallica T-shirts or Slayer T-shirts or um, Gujira T-shirts or wide range of different different metal bands. There seems to be quite a large number of links and a, quite a large number of people who are physicists are very much into metal music. We've had within the group here, a lot of the researchers have been heavily into metal. So that was the first thing. Then a number of years back, I was uh, invited to blog for the Institute of Physics here. And one of the first um, blog posts I write was about these links between um, metal and and physics. It's not just metal, of course, it's music. Um, With quantum physics, you're talking about it really ultimately a physics of waves, Fourier analysis. Have you done any Fourier analysis yet? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So really... Much of quantum mechanics is just applied for reanalysis. It really is. Um, so it's waves, sines and cosines and phase differences and interference due to phase they are absolutely core to quantum physics, of course. But they're also core, core to classical music in terms of how we, we make notes and, and sounds on instruments. So I, I wanted to bring those two things together. Metal is great because... Uh, as well as the sort of links in terms of musical notes, there are lots of things we do in metal, like pinched harmonics or the way we chug on a guitar. And all of these have different links to aspects of quantum physics. And I wrote this blog post and then I thought, well, that's OK. That's a blog post. as a few hundred words. It's an interesting idea, but I don't think it's got legs for a book. But then I got contacted by... Uh, um, an agent who was asking, have you got any ideas for books? And usually I just put those in the bin because usually I don't. And I said, OK, I haven't got ideas for academic book, but I have this idea for what could be a popular science book. And he was intrigued and he suggested I pursue it. So then I sat down and started thinking about it and um, ended up with a whole load of different themes in terms of how you can relate quantum physics and, and metal, which was great because I love both. So it was a real pleasure to write that book. Yeah, I can imagine how fun it would be. So how did 60 symbols start? Well, that's one you'd need to ask really Brady Haran about. Um, so I wasn't involved right at the start of, of 60 symbols. I came in, I guess it was up and running for a few months. And I got involved back in 2009 after 60 symbols had kicked off with a few of my colleagues, including in particular Mike Merrifield, who's an astronomer here, who'd be, you know, another great person. No, another, a good, a great person, sorry, to... Um, to interview as, as, as part of this. Um, but he, uh, Brady came along and just popped into my office, knocked on the door and just popped in and said, I'm looking for people who'd be willing to explain some aspects of physics in a, in a short video. Would you be interested? And I thought, yeah, that sounds like fun. And that's really how it kicked off. And the first one we did wasn't great. 
Definitely wasn't great. I can't remember. I think it was on the speed of light. You can find it. It's on 69. It was, it was not great, but it was a learning experience as we went on, found stuff that would work and stuff that didn't work. And what works best for me and Brady, at least, I don't think this is true for when he interacts with others in the school, but certainly me and Brady, it can be a little bit confrontational at times that's possibly pushing it a little bit too much but sometimes we have spats and the ones I really like is where he and I are arguing about how should this go how should we explain this and he's you know Brady has told me when I've been in the middle of something that's shit stop and let's think about how we're going to explain that again and he's got a really good understanding of his audience and he's got a good understanding of what will work in terms of an explanation what will connect and what will engage you know, if, we're, if it were left up to us academics to do 60 symbols without Brady's involvement, those videos would get 10 views or whatever. It would be awful. It's really Brady's expertise, not just as a, as a journalist, but also as almost as a director in terms of, of pulling out, um, you know, the best from those from that type from that type of video. Yeah, truly, the end product of videos is absolutely bonkers. Like we all learn so, so much and very easy ways that's wonderful that's really really good to hear i'll pass that on to all my colleagues here involved in 60 symbols but thank you for saying that's great so so, so i had a question like you say you it, like it's a different style of uh teaching than you would explanation than you're accustomed to right so did that help you in like normal classes as well yeah that's oh that's a wonderful point that's a really really good point yeah so what initially when we started doing these videos i would pick up a pen or i'd go to the there's a if you can see it there's a blackboard in my office over yeah. there or i'd yeah. go to the blackboard or whiteboard and i start go, going with equations and graphs and brady would just go stop and he'd take the pen out and just stop put that to one side and um just explain it to me and that's difficult because the first thing, you know, if I want to explain the Schrodinger equation, I'm going to write down the Schrodinger equation. And I'm going to go, well, it's got these solutions. It's got these eigenstates, you know, talking about the time-independent Schrodinger equation. It's got these eigenstates. And that means nothing to somebody who has no training in physics or no background in, in science. That means absolutely nothing. So he forced me, really, to consider how to explain things in a much more, using much better use of metaphors and analogies. And to sort of think beyond the mathematics. As physicists, we're trained to use mathematics all the time, but to, to put the mathematics to one side and think about how to how better to explain it. And then interestingly, in terms of your point, that is really fed back into how I teach this stuff. Because obviously in the undergraduate lecture theory and in the undergraduate um, teaching, the maths is there. But what I want to do is try and bring that maths to life, to find better metaphors and analogies to bring that maths to life. So, yeah, he has been, he's really played a key role in changing how I teach, definitely. Wonderful. So let's shift gears towards your career again. What were your career high points? Like, when did you feel at the top of the world? <laughs> what a great question. So science, I would say, is a lot of... Um, so, for example, we've had a few months where it's been bloody miserable. Lots and lots of things have broken. We work in ultra high vacuum. We work at low temperatures. And so you spend a lot of your time fixing stuff, fixing ultra high vacuum leaks. If, if a piece of equipment fails in an ultra high vacuum chamber, you have to bring the entire thing up there. You have to fix it. You have to then bring it back down again. And you have to spend a lot of money on helium, and you don't want that helium to just boil away with without doing something useful. Most recently, we've had a hard disk crash catastrophically, and we've had controllers don't work. So there's a lot of misery, but that makes the times when things work all the more sweeter, that you spend an awful lot of time and effort trying to get to a particular point. And the difficulty is, I guess, just when you're doing this stuff on an everyday basis when you're manipulating atoms it can you can get to the point where well that's the job that's what i'm doing you know today i'm going to go in and move atoms you need to step back and go you're actually moving atoms that's that's what you're doing you're moving atoms around and not very many people have the opportunity to do that and you need to appreciate just how good that is so yeah it's 
I'm, it's not always plain sailing, but when it works, there's like no other feeling, particularly if it's a new measurement, if it's a system that nobody else has, has looked at. You might be the first person in the world or perhaps the first person in the universe or the multiverse, if you're that way inclined, to have seen this. And that's, you know, that really does get you out of bed in the mornings to get you into work. What are the most uh, extreme conditions, like physically wise, uh, Say that again. It broke up a little bit. I think you were. You think you were asking what are the most extreme conditions? Yeah, in which you have worked in, say, extreme temperatures or what? Yeah. So we work. Um, the most recent microscope we've installed gets us for us is pretty cold. For others in the department, not so cold. But for us, is pretty cold, which is 300 millikelvin. So given that the temperature, the the microwave background is off the order of 3k, 2.7k. So it's about 10 times colder than that which for us is pretty damn cold however i have colleagues just downstairs and down the other end of the corridor in cold atoms who regularly work at nano kelvin t- temperatures certainly hundreds of nano kelvin um which uh, th- i've heard their experiments described as um being akin they do both einstein condensates so cold atoms i've heard their experiments described as as akin to holding a snowball from melting at the heart of the sun in that they're trying to, to, you know, cool this thing down. So, um, yeah, and then in terms of pressures, we go to ultra high vacuum. So it's not we're not putting pressure on an object, but trying to remove gas so that we have the minimum number of contamination contaminants. And we typically work at about 10 to the minus 10 millibars. So that's 13 orders of magnitude below atmospheric pressure, which doesn't those numbers don't make mean a lot. But that's comparable to the pressure you have on the surface of the moon of that, that order. So a, a very, very high vacuum, ultra high vacuum, as we call it. Yeah. See, these extreme conditions that you put in front of us, uh, that's that's one of the things I have to think about experimentalists. Like, how do you even think about achieving such a condition to first uh, do your experiment? Yeah, but there's a lot of, it's not like we we suddenly, over the last few years, have developed all this ourselves. There's a massive community uh, who's worked on ultra high vacuum, the entire surface science community, which has been going since the 40s and 50s. So, you know, there's a lot of expertise out there. There's a lot of knowledge about how to achieve those pressures. One thing we have to do, for example, is re- is regularly bake the systems, literally bake them, put them in an oven, because the key contaminant that we have on any surface is water. We need to get rid of that. So we heat the surface up to 150 degrees, pump, 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 pump. And then when we cool down, we get a much better vacuum. But you know, it's not just one person or one group developing this. It's a great community of people coming together to develop these. And it, it over the past decades, it, it gets there. On the other hand, some of the more, some of the really interesting experiments we were involved with, this was about a decade ago, didn't involve any of that. Uh, I might actually, uh, let me see. Just one second. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good, good, good. I promise I didn't plan this. Um we also did experiments which were basically this this uh, this is a colloidal suspension of gold nanoparticles. I hope you can see it's red. They are in this case I can't remember five nanometers across, and there are some really interesting. You take a droplet of this and put it on a surface. A really simple experiment, like not not even an A level student, but a, a GCSE a high school student, a 13, 14 year old could do, or even 10 year old could do. And you just take a little droplet of that, put it on a surface, and let it dry. What happens? How do the particles arrange themselves? And the particles arrange themselves in a wide range of really, really fascinating patterns that have connections to patterns right across a range of different length scales. So that's a very simple experiment. No ultra high vacuum, no low temperature, and yet incredibly, incredibly interesting. And I have colleagues here who work on looking at paint dry. So that's, you know, everybody says paint drying is the most boring process, but not if you look at it on a microscopic scale. It isn't in terms of what the, the colloidal suspension is doing. It's, it's really, really fascinating. So you can find really exciting, really interesting physics in the most mundane or apparently the most mundane of, of systems. So I guess in the end, it's all about perspective, huh? Yeah. Oh, that's a great way of putting it. It's absolutely about perspective. Yeah, yeah. And what's what's intensely boring to one person is exceptionally interesting to another because they have a different perspective on it. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. So my next question would be, how do you think STEM education has evolved from say, your generation to ours? Like it has changed. According to you, has the craze for STEM increased or decreased? 
that again more great questions so um obviously what you what your generation has is is youtube and a lot of um content science content generated via youtube and via social media and various other things and that largely has been great i have some reservations because sometimes there's a real glossing over clickbait approach and an approach to science that sometimes is oh wow look at this and then move on to the next thing and the problem is then when you have to do it at some level of rigor in an undergraduate degree people go hang on this isn't like minute physics anymore or this isn't like for veritasium or I, i'm actually having to do a lot of work here and some of this maths is really boring uh, why can't we just have the explosions so that's <laughs> That's the concern I have, and um, the term that's used sometimes is edutainment, so a mixture of education and entertainment. And that has its place in terms of enthusing and inspiring and engaging people, but it's not the only thing. And, and students, I think, sometimes find it a little bit more difficult now when they actually have to do the subject a bit more rigorously and really get into – it's not just the mathematics. It's you know sometimes doing an experiment – it is exciting, but sometimes, you know, measuring over and over and over again is fairly tedious, but it has to be done. You know, it has to be done systematically. So there is that. Um, in terms of STEM careers, I think there's always been a need for STEM careers. I think there's been a recognition, a greater recognition over the last couple of decades of the importance of STEM. I, you're probably going to think this is strange to hear from a physicist, but actually I would say that sometimes we overemphasize STEM over things like the arts and humanities. We need the arts and humanities as, as well. So, for example, you know, we need to be able to write. You need to be able to communicate. And I know an awful lot of physicists, including many of my tutees, pick their modules on the basis of how little writing do I have to do in this? They, they try to choose the modules that involve as little writing as possible. But as a professional physicist, as I sometimes like to think I am, the majority of my time is spent on writing. It's spent on words, not maths. Because, you know, you're spending a lot of time writing grant proposals or writing papers or writing material for various different uh, sources. And as I've said, I spend a lot of time writing books, etc. So... Writing is a core part of what we do. So STEM is important, but so too are the arts and humanities. And, and we shouldn't, I hate this idea that we've got this battle between STEM and arts and humanities over here. And the other thing I hate, and I hear this an awful lot at, uh, in terms of, of school, high school, is that the arts and humanities are, are said to be the creative subjects. And STEM is over here as if there isn't creativity involved in STEM. That drives me up the wall so i we need to bring arts and humanities and stem together a lot more yeah uh, that's true and staying on that path one of our questions was people say that traditional stem is losing traction among the youth right skills like coding and marketing and stuff like that are, tra are overtaking the youth uh, popularity what's your take on this um, yeah, so coding certainly, and unfortunately marketing, I don't have a lot of time for marketing, I've got to say, but coding is important, and I, coding is really important within physics, and I, in fact, the interesting thing about that though, I hope I don't go off too much of a tangent, we've had a number of our undergraduates, quite a few of our undergraduates have gone into coding careers, and in fact, in quite a few cases, physicists are preferred to computer scientists when it comes to coding. So, for example, if you're involved in a games engine, and you're developing a games engine, you know, that needs real world physics in there. Are you going to turn to a physicist with computing skills or a computer scientist? You're going to turn to a physicist with computer skills because they understand the differential equations. They understand just how to simulate this stuff in a way that a computer scientist doesn't. And so often, although those, you know, hardcore coding skills that you get in a computer science degree are important, Physicists get an awful lot of coding in their degrees as, as well, and often that coding for certain companies and for certain industries is more important than the type of coding that comes out of a computer science degree. Now, I would say that because I'm a physicist, and I'm sure computer scientists would argue precisely the opposite, but the evidence is there. We've had quite a few students go into coding careers uh, with physics degrees. So it's a question, it's interesting you raise marketing, I guess it's a question of how you sell yourself. 
So, you know, you might have a physics degree and there might be a bias towards computing or whatever, but you can sell that degree in the context of computing, I think. Yeah. So, sir, if you were not an academician, who would you be? Uh, so I'd, uh, probably um, at the end of my degree, I was not even thinking about doing a PhD until this PhD involved with STM came up. And where I would have gone would be sound engineering. I, w- I wanted to move into sound engineering. And in fact, if I ever retire, that's probably where I'll go back to. Um, I'm very interested in, in sound engineering, recording studios, the recording side of things. So that's probably where I'd have gone. Um, yeah, a change. Uh, I had a short answer to one of your questions. <laughs> no, that's completely fine. How do you think has the pandemic altered the ways in which research is done? In which research? Oh, so can I address that into the context of teaching first, and then yeah, we'll sure, get to sure. but yeah, that, uh, another great question. So, um, I think pandemic has changed teaching, and I think changed teaching for the better. And I hope that now we're sort of coming out the other side, though. So there's always issues with new variants, etc., and we never quite know when we're going to go back into lockdown again. But there were things that happened during the pandemic and the lockdowns that I really hope that we don't go, you know, that we keep on board. For example, I don't have a lot of time for the traditional lecture. Um, the idea that I go and stand in a lecture theatre, my colleagues go and stand in a lecture theatre and talk at you for 50 minutes while you write it down just seems incredibly archaic to me. There are much better ways of using our time. So. Like many others, I developed a number of videos um, and taught the course via video. I'm going to keep those videos. And then what I do is I use the in-person sessions, the where are the lecture sessions, to really try and foster as much engagement as possible. So lots of multiple choice questions, lots of simulations, lots of Q&A sessions, rather than me standing up and just talking, which is just a waste of everybody's time. When it comes to exams, the other thing is because we had online open book exams, there was a move away from the traditional exam paper, which is a question tend to have a big chunk of book work. You know, please give me back what is on pages 44 to 47 of your notes, a particular derivation, and then a problem. It's moved the entire other way that the book work has gone. Surprisingly, a lot of students, at least here, have said that they prefer that that. Um, problem based approach rather than the sort of work approach. I, I hope to hell we can keep that and we don't go back to traditional exams. That's on the teaching side. On the research side, we certainly got used to driving instruments remotely a lot more. And I think that's been a benefit of COVID is, you know, logging in with TeamViewer, getting things up and running, thinking about how clever ways to automate the experiment so you don't have to be there. Um, that's certainly been, I hope, an important legacy of COVID. Um, for possibly also a little bit more concerned about safety practices and thinking about just how to be safe in the lab, um, which is no bad thing either. So, yeah, great questions. On the research front, what has changed by the effects of pandemic? What has changed? Um, well, I, th- I don't know. Things are starting to evolve back to where they were before. I don't know if I don't know whether research has been affected to the same extent that teaching has been affected by the pandemic. There was an awful lot of downtime, and I know a lot of people are very keen to get back into the into the lab. But I say, as I said, I think really the core aspect that's changed, if I can point to one thing that's changed, is that a greater focus on automation of experiments to allow for research to carry on, even if people aren't in the lab. Yeah, that's I agree absolutely. So just a side fun question here now. Did you uh, if have you ever come to India and would you like uh, to visit and explore? I have back in 2010, um, and I was trying to remember. This was awful. I was trying to remember exactly the name of the university, but um, this is it was quite some time ago, so 12 years ago. Alagappa University, which is in Tamil. Apologies for the um, the pronunciation. Tamil Nadu province. Um, so that was back in 2010 for a, a nanoscience conference. That's the only time I've been in India. We did have a, um, a postdoc here who's uh, now a lecturer in uh, Bits Palani. Um, so, um, yeah, so th- there are some links there. And he keeps he's invited me a number of times and it just hasn't panned out. But I hope to get back to India sometime soon. We wish to find you some soon. Yes, <laughs> We would love to meet you in person. 
<laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I hope I hope that can happen. <laughs> so now uh, I guess we're all out of questions. Okay. Uh, interacting with you today was a great learning experience, and there there has been so much to learn from you and your experiences. You are indeed one of the coolest physicists slash person I have ever interacted with, oh, and the insights. <laughs> the insights you have given throughout this podcast will be really helpful to us and everyone who is listening. I would like to thank you again for sharing your experiences and knowledge with us. And this has been on air with Seth Celestia. Yeah, it's been an honor for me too. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. Really, really enjoyed it.